1 Corinthians chapter 15 this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We're almost all the way through with our tour through 1 Corinthians. <clears throat> all right, here in 1 Corinthians <clears throat> chapter 15, uh, these first verses, 1 through 8, it's going to be proof concern, concerning Jesus' bodily resurrection. So... Verses 1 through 2 says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. So if y'all remember there in Acts chapter 18, Paul, he mentions preaching the gospel to the Corinthians before, and there in Acts 18, he says that many of the Corinthians here, or Chapter 18, Acts, Paul didn't say this, but, but it says in Acts 18 that many of the Corinthians here and believed and were baptized. So it's apparent that not all had believed the gospel that Paul had preached there. Verse 3, it goes on to say, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. So quick note here, notice that Paul, he says he delivered the gospel that he received. He received the gospel in a different way than the other 12 apostles did. Because uh, they're, uh, hold on, losing my place here. Because the 12, the other 12, they saw and heard Jesus himself. They were with Jesus during Jesus' earthly ministry. Paul, he wasn't though. He had received the gospel in a rather supernatural kind of way. Of course, he had that supernatural that supernatural encounter with Jesus there on Damascus Road after the crucifixion. In Galatians chapter 1, it says that, that the gospel that, that was preached to Paul, it wasn't of any human origin, nor did he receive it from man, or, nor was he taught it by man. It, it says that he had received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. Verse 4 says, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. The scriptures that Paul's talking about here is clearly found in Psalm 22, Isaiah 53, and Daniel 9. So if you get a chance, find those in your Bible and highlight them. Verses 5 through 8 says, And that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that, he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. And last of all, he was seen of me also, as, as of one born, born out of due time. So the gospel, it doesn't just stop with the fact that Jesus rose again on the third day, it, but it goes on to add that he was seen afterwards. You know, Jesus didn't just reveal himself to one person. It says right here that he was seen of over 500 brethren at once. And, of course, Jesus, he was seen by Paul, who was born out of due time. Being born out of due time, that likely means that Paul was born again after the other apostles. And uh, he wasn't with Jesus during Jesus' earthly ministry. But uh, think about all the false religions out there that were invented by just one man and one man claiming that only they had received revelation from God or, or that they saw God themselves. That ain't the case in Christianity. There's just way too many witnesses. You know, if there was no risen Christ and the, the dead body of Jesus laid in a tomb and decayed like every other man would, then Christianity would be just like every other religion and Jesus would be just like every other dead founder of religion religion his bones would be in a grave somewhere but that ain't the case verse 9 for I am the least of the apostles that am not meet to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God we kind of see Paul's humility right here 
truth is, Paul was likely the greatest of all the apostles, really, despite his past of persecuting Christians. You know, I think we can learn a lesson right here that's repeated throughout the entire Bible. God can and will use anybody for his glory. God, he'll take the least and he'll make them the greatest and he'll, he'll take the most unlikely and he'll make them the most likely to be used for his glory. That's just the way that God, that God works. Verse 10, but by the grace of God, I am what I am and his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. You know, Paul, he wasn't about to allow the grace that God had bestowed upon him to just be wasted. He, he resolved in his heart to serve the Lord with everything he had. And that's why he says, I labored more abundantly than they all. You know, Paul, he determined to work harder in the ministry than any other of the apostles because Paul didn't get to see it to sit at Jesus' feet during his earthly ministry. And, and Paul had also persecuted the church of God before his conversion. But most importantly, though, Paul, he knew it wasn't him, but he, he says it was the grace of God that was with him. You know, it was only by God's grace that he was able to accomplish the things that he accomplished. And we should ask ourselves, has the grace that's been bestowed upon us been in vain? You know, the grace, that grace wasn't wasted with Paul. Paul, he got really busy working for the Lord. Verse 11. Therefore, whether it were I or they, so we preach, and so ye believed. You know, both Paul and the other apostles, they had preached the same gospel to, to the ones there in Corinth, and they believed it. And the foundation of their salvation and faith was, was, was in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Our, uh, from verses 12 to 19, Paul's going to present an argument that's concerning Jesus, or concerning the bodily resurrection. So verse 12, now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? So we see right here that some of the Corinthians, they had a hard time believing this, this bodily resurrection. Verses 13 through 15 says, but if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain? Yea, and our, yea, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up. If so be that, the dead rise not. So Paul, he's pointing out to him, if there's no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen, their preaching was in vain, the faith of the Corinthians was in vain, and the apostles were false witnesses and falsely testifying against God. So basically, Paul, he's, he's confronting these doubters right here with the logical conclusions of their position, really. Verses 16 through 18. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised? And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. Ye are yet in your sins. Then they also, which are fallen asleep in Christ, are perished. So if the position of the, the, the dead don't rise, if that was true, these conclusions would follow. Christ did not rise. Our, our faith is in vain. We're still in our sins. And, and all believers who have died before, they've all perished. You know, we're a, we're a fundamentalist church here. And the resurrection is one of the fundamentals of the faith. Amen. So... So looking at Paul's argument here, you can see that the future is pretty bleak for people who don't stick to the fundamentals. Verse 19, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. It's easy to misread this verse, but what Paul's saying is, is if our hope in Christ doesn't take us beyond this present life, then we're the most miserable of all folks. Not only are we then deceived, but, but we unwittingly become deceivers ourselves. So verses 20 through 28, Paul's going to talk about the order of the resurrection. Verse 20, but now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. So yeah, the, the, 
the blessed truth is that Jesus Christ did rise from the dead. You know, Jesus in his resurrection, he became the first fruits of the dead. Sleep's often used as like a, a synonym for being dead. I'm sure y'all know that. But Jesus, him being the first fruits of the dead, he, he's, he's the, uh, the first of the coming resurrection. And this means that there's going to be more coming after him. Amen. You know, I guess you can call that a, a harvest of resurrected believers. Verse 21 through 22. For since by man came death, by man, also, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. So, you know, death came through man being Adam. And the resurrection will come through man also, Jesus. Of course, Jesus is fully man and fully God. But uh, let me point out, Paul, he's not subscribing to universalism here. It says, in Adam all die. We as humans, we're, we're in Adam. And Adam was the first man, and, and sin entered the world through Adam, and, and we're going to pay the consequences of sin. But in Christ, it says, all shall be made alive. This doesn't include everybody. This ain't universalism. It says, in Christ. This means only those who are in Christ. You know, God loves us so much that he became a man, and, and he lived here on this earth, and he willingly suffered and died at the hands of humans. And uh, he conquered death for us on our behalf so that we don't have to die. Verses uh, 23 through 24. But every man is in his own order, Christ the firstfruits. Afterward, they that are Christ at his coming. Then cometh the end. Then he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. So we, we see a sequence pertaining to the resurrection right here. Jesus Christ first, of course. It says, Then they that are Christ at his coming. This is referring to his return there at, at the rapture where the dead in Christ shall rise. See 1 Corinthians chapter 4. I mean, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, I'm sorry. But the coming of Christ mentioned there, that's undoubtedly referring to the rapture. And next, Paul says, then cometh the end. And this surely refers to when Christ, he's going to deliver up the kingdom to God after the final rebellion in the battle of Gog and Magog there that you read about in Revelation 20. But it's at that time that Jesus Christ shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. And that's when Satan, he's going to be cast into the lake, and fire, lake of fire forever. Verses 25 through 26 for he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. So it's going to be there at that last battle when Christ will have the final victory over his enemies. It's also going to be at that time when death, the, the last enemy, will be destroyed once and for all. Uh, you know, death never will a, a, again occur after that in the new heaven and new earth, uh, meaning the, the eternal kingdom that's coming. Amen. So... Uh, but right here, Paul, he just gave us a little dose of eschatology. And eschatology is the study of things pertaining to the end times. Verses 27 through 28. For he hath put all things under his feet, but when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted, which did put all things under him. And then all things shall be subdued unto him. Then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. So it's kind of a difficult passage right here. It, it seems like Paul, he's subordinating the Son to the Father. But, but first off, when Paul, he writes about Christ putting all things under his feet, there is one exception, and that exception is the one who put all things under Christ. This is obviously referring to God the Father. But, but when Paul, he says that the Son will be subject to God the Father so that God may be all in all, he's not implying that Jesus is inferior to God in essence. He's, really, he's talking about the function of the Son. So one day when, when all of Jesus' enemies are 
defeated, including death, Jesus, he's going to hand the millennial kingdom over to God at the end of Jesus' earthly messianic reign. Then the eternal state's going to begin after that, and there's no end to that. You know, there's going to be a, a perfect merging of Jesus' uh, earthly Davidic millennial throne, and it's going to be merged with the eternal throne of God. And uh, after that, then all things are going to be under the administration of the, the triune God. And if, if I've confused you on this, because it sounds kind of confusing, just see me after class. But if you don't want to try to wrap your brain around it right now, don't worry, because we're all going to be there and see this happen one day. All right, verses 29 through 34. It, he's going to talk about how resurrection, Belief in the resurrection is, is vital to endure persecution. Verse 29, Else what shall they do which are baptized for the dead? If the dead rise not at all, why are they then baptized for the dead? So apparently some of the Corinthians, they believed that a living person could be baptized in place of a dead person. And uh, I understand that Mormons, they practice this even to this day. This is called vicarious baptism, and it's heresy. But the point here is that it, it would be meaningless to baptize folks in the place of dead ones if, if there was no real resurrection of the dead. Verse 30, and why stand we in jeopardy every hour? You know, back in them days, baptism was done in public. It was done in ponds and lakes and rivers and the ocean. It is a very public identifying with Jesus Christ. And when you constantly got persecution looming over your head, then baptism, it becomes a real statement of faith. And since baptism is an illustration of being buried with Christ and being resurrected with Christ, why, why would believers risk persecution by publicly being baptized if there's no resurrection whatsoever? <clears throat> Verse uh, 31 I protest by your rejoicing, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord. I die daily. So in our language today, the word protest, it, it, it means a hard no. It means to oppose. But back in the day of King James there, um, the, the definition of protest is to call as a witness in affirming or denying or to prove an affirmation. So, really, the meaning of this verse is, while we rejoice in Christ, I face the prospect of death daily. So, just one of them words you can get hung up on there is protest, because in English, it has changed a little bit over the last 400 years. Verse uh, 32, if after the manner of men I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, what advantageth it me if the dead rise not? Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. So, of course, we don't read about Paul fighting wild animals at Ephesus or anywhere, but, but what he's likely referring to here is being a victim of, like, the lions at one of the Colosseums. So they're at the Colosseums. They would take Christians out there, and they'd just be torn to pieces by lions. But the, the point is, though, if the dead rise not, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. You know, if there's no resurrection, we might as well just go out there and live it up because we're about to die anyhow. And uh, Paul, he might have been just kind of quoting what proponents of the anti-resurrection view were saying back then. Verse 33, be not deceived, evil communications corrupt good manners. So Paul, he's basically saying not to be fooled by these resurrection deniers and that their false teaching could possibly rub off on you. You know, it's okay to disagree with a brother and a sister on some issues, but, but if someone doesn't agree with you on the fundamentals, being like the deity of Christ, the virgin birth, salvation by faith alone, the resurrection, you really ought to break fellowship with that person. That's really how this fundamentalist movement grew when the theological liberalism started waxing strong there in the late 1800s. But uh, verse 34, awake to righteousness and sin not, for some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. 
So some of these folks, they were delusional in their sense of spiritual superiority. These resurrection deniers who were holding to such an anti-resurrection view, they were literally ignorant of God. And Paul, he shames them right here. All right, verses 35 through 49 is going to talk about the, the nature of the resurrection for the dead. It's a long chapter right here, so I'm trying to get through it fast. So. All right, verse 35. But some man will say, how are the dead raised up, and with what body do they come? So that's a legitimate question that somebody who doesn't understand the resurrection might ask. You know, how can life come from death, and, and what will be the nature of the resurrection body? But Paul, he says here in the next verse, in verse 36, he says, Thou fool, that which thou sowest is not quickened, except it die. So whoever Paul's answering right here, they must have thought that the body would be coming out of the grave in like this, this state of decay, like a, like a zombie. But uh, Paul says it's foolish to think this way, and he compares the natural body to a seed. You know, the believer's body is buried with, with the prospect of resurrection, just like how a seed is buried with the prospect of it one day coming out of the ground in, in a plant. Uh, verses 37 through 38, and that which thou sowest, thou sowest not. That body that shall be but bare grain, it may chance of wheat or of some other grain, but God giveth it a body as it hath pleased him and to every seed his own body. You know, when a sower plants, they don't plant a stalk in the ground. They just plant a, a bare seed in the ground in the hopes that it's going to produce weed or grain or whatever it is. And God gives that seed a stalk as it pleases God. But, but before there can be the new life of a plant, a seed must die and be buried in the ground. The stalk ain't placed in the ground, but the seed is. And, and each seed, it produces its own respective type of plant. Verse 39 through 41. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another of fishes, and another of birds. There are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial. But the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars, for one star differeth from another star in glory. So there's all kinds of diversity in God's creation. There's different types of creatures, and humans and animals. But there's not only diversity here in the earthly sphere, but also in the heavenly sphere as well. Um, the, the sun and the moon and the stars, they all have a varying brilliance to them. And, uh, you know, there's varying celestial bodies such as galaxies and supernovas and, and things that my little mind just can't even perceive. But, you know, if you're into looking at NASA photos like I am, those, those pictures they take from outer space, they reveal so much of the heavenly bodies out there that's just mind blowing yeah. and uh, the, it, it reveals a more brilliance to it that you can't even comprehend or see from here on earth trying to look through our atmosphere because it's so much of it's filtered out and it's, it's really incredible just looking at photos of outer space, deep space. Verse 42 so also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. So just like there's varying forms of nature, whether it be plants, animals, or even celestial bodies, there's also more than one form of the human body. You've got a physical body and you've got a spiritual body. And our, our physical bodies are sown, buried in the ground, in, in the corruption of death, just like a seed is. But, but like the seed, the, the physical bodies of God people, it's going to be raised in this incorruptible body. Verses 43 through 44, it is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. 
It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body, and there is a spiritual body. So Paul, he makes it really clear right there. Ain't nothing I can say about that. Verse 45, and so it is written, the first man Adam was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. So Paul, he quotes Genesis 2-7 here, where the Bible says back there in Genesis, and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. So as the descendants of the first Adam were made like him, uh, we're just living souls inhabiting a, a mortal body, and we bear the image of Adam, who's our earthly parent. But obviously the last Adam being mentioned here is Jesus Christ. And as, as followers of Christ, we're going to be clothed with these immortal bodies. And uh, we're, we're going to bear the image of Jesus, our heavenly Lord, one day. You know, in the first Adam, we're just flesh, with, which is temporary. But in the last Adam, Jesus Christ, he... he regenerates in us this this eternal life-giving spirit when we're saved when we when we get in Christ verses 46 through 47 how be it that was not first which is spiritual but that which is natural and afterward that which is spiritual the first man is of the earth earthly the second man is the Lord from heaven so the natural physical body comes first here, and, and it's followed by the spiritual body. But the first man, the, the, the physical natural man, he's made of the dust of the earth. But the second man, the spiritual resurrected man, is from heaven. Verses 48 through 49. As is the earthly, such are they also that are earthly. And as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the earthly, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. And, and again, a, a natural, physical, unsaved man, he's earthly, and, and a reborn man is heavenly. The, the, the earthly, natural man, he can't comprehend much beyond the physical body. However, a spiritually reborn man will understand heavenly and spiritual things. Everything Jesus said and did was heavenly and spiritual when he was on earth rather than, than earthly. And, and just like we have borne the characteristics of Adam, you know, in our natural births, we're going to bear the image of Christ in our resurrection bodies. But uh, here's the last stretch right here, verses 50 through 58, and it's going to talk about the nature of the resurrection for believers. So verse 50 says, now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, and neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. So we ain't taking our bodies to heaven with us, which I ain't too mad about because I'm 41. I'm starting to feel my age a little bit for the first time. I'm sure some of y'all ache more than I do, but I certainly I'm starting to ache in my back and tired and ain't got the energy I used to have. But, uh, but... This verse right here, it tells us that a change must happen before any of us make it to heaven. Verse 51 says, Behold, I shew you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. And sleep, again, of course, is a euphemism for death. But this, the, the big mystery here is there's going to be people that make it to heaven without ever dying. And this right here is the first mention of the rapture in the Bible. Uh... I'm not going to go too deep into the rapture today because that's a big rabbit hole and there's a lot with it. But I'll try to do a complete class on the rapture soon and, and I'll present to y'all a scripture that proves that the pre-tribulational rapture view is, is really the true right biblical view. But anyhow, if you read the Bible from Genesis 1 all the way up to this point right here, you would conclude that a person must die before they go to heaven. And uh, you have two exceptions, of course. You got Enoch and Elijah, but they were raptured up themselves. 
but uh, but apart from them, it would be pretty clear up to this point that a believer must die before he reaches glory. Verse 52 says, In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. You know, this is going to happen in the twinkling of an eye, a blink of an eye, and that is exactly one-fifth of a second. That's how. That's fast. I can't snap. But that's, that's that fast right there. But that, that's quick. That's how fast this is going to happen. But uh, the phrase at the last trump, people get hung up on this. This ain't referring to the seventh trumpet there in Revelation 11. You know, back in them days, trumpets were common signaling of devices, and especially for the military. So Paul, he's using a metaphor right here. You know, back in them days, in the army times, when, when uh, an army was in battle and they'd blow the last trump, that meant the fighting's over stop fighting, go home. And also, there when the Roman soldiers were occupying Jerusalem, you know, they had guards all over the city keeping watch. They had a trump to, a trump blast to begin guard duty, and they also had a last trump that meant stand down, your watch is over. So, Paul's just using this metaphor right here. But it, anyhow, it says, at that moment, the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Of course, corruptible means that your body, your dead corpse, is subject to decay. But these dead believers, they're going to be instantaneously transformed into this incorruptible, glorified spiritual body. Verse 53, for this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. Our corruptible physical bodies are going to be put on like, like clean clothing. It, this incorruptible, glorified spiritual body like Jesus. Uh, and, and moreover, our, our mortal body, which is prone to death, it's going to put on an immortal body. Verse 54. Just saw four more verses here. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that it, it, that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. And Paul, he quotes Isaiah 25, 8 right here. And this scripture is going to be fulfilled. Uh, verse 55 says, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? And Paul, he quotes Hosea uh, 13, 14 here. You know, some venomous creatures, they bring death by their sting. And, and because of the resurrection, Paul, he asks death, where is thy sting? Whence, whence is its victory? You know, the resurrection has vanquished all that, just vanquished it. Note here, though, that the word translated as grave is Hades. So this, this is going beyond talking about a physical death here. It, the word for grave is Hades. This is talking about a spiritual death. Uh, verse 56, the sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. So death's venom is sin. You know, it's deadlier than, than any snake bite from any poisonous snake or venomous snake, such as a, even a black mamba, which they say is the deadliest of all venomous snakes. And this venom, it doesn't only kill you physically, but it kills you spiritually as well. And, and, and sin's power to bind, it, it's through the breaking of God's law. Verse 57, But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So because Jesus, he fulfilled the law, he obtained our eternal salvation. And, and Jesus is literally the anti-venom against the deadly effects of sin. In verse 58, last verse right here. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. So... I'll close right here and give Paul the last word. And we only got one more chapter left, and we're done with 1 Corinthians after this. And I'll be ready to give Paul a break for a little while because he's wordy, and it's uh, hard to teach Paul sometimes. But uh, thank you all. See you all at service.